Happy Father's Day. For Father's Day, you are here in the Father's house. There are many people that don't have that privilege to be in the Father's house. To be here tonight, healthy, smiling with your loved ones, it's just God's grace, God's gift to you, the Father's gift to you today. Many of you are here because the Father is giving you a second chance. Many of us are here today because our Father in heaven wants to show his goodness one more time in your life. I invite you to stand up this evening and I want us to read from Luke chapter 15, from verses 11, about the parable of the prodigal son. Let us stand and let us read together. And then he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a faraway country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to them, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. He may be seated. Of all of the parables in the scripture, the parable of the prodigal son is one of my favorite parables. 
This parable is best known and most memorable to many of us. The parable of the prodigal son is in reality the story of two rebellious sons and their loving and gracious father. This parable illustrates God's love. It illustrates God's joy over the salvation of the lost. You know why? Because it brings to attention the human aspect of salvation. This parable of the prodigal son focuses on man's sin. It focuses on rejection, on repentance, and then lastly, on the return back to the Heavenly Father, on the return back to God. This story revolves around three characters, the younger son or the prodigal son, the father and the oldest son. The story takes place within a culture whose ethical priority was to seek family honor and to avoid any type of shame at all cost. However, as we already read, the younger son of this family appears to be the extreme example of shame by his rebellion against his father, against his family, and all that is right. Then in the eyes of the scribes, in the eyes of the Pharisees who are listening, the father appears more shameful because he accepts the son back. But to all of us today who understand this story, the older brother is the ultimate presentation of shame. And he represents the scribes and the Pharisees. He represents the religious people who are always judging who believed they were the most honorable and without sin and without any shame. However, we, go, we won't get deep into that because I want our focus tonight to be on the sinner's repentance, on the sinner's sorrow and regrets, on the sinner's repentance and on how God's love and forgiveness activates when repentance takes place. So church... The first thing that we must do is we must repent. We must repent because sin destroys our spiritual and our physical life. Right off the bat, I want to make a statement. The devil is a liar and sin is a destroyer. Satan is a devourer. He is a thief who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy according to John chapter 10 verse 10. And as a member of this father's home, the young man starts with everything. But one day, he becomes ungrateful. He becomes selfish. He becomes impatient. So what he does, he takes himself out of the home. And he makes himself fatherless. He decides to leave all because he wants to gratify his sinful desires. All because he wants to make himself homeless by going to a distant country. And without any self-control, without any satisfaction, <clears throat> he ends up very poor. And in the end, after he spent his last dime, he is friendless, he is footless. He wallows in the pig pen with what the Jewish people of that day considered filthy, unclean animals. You see, church, this is what living in sin does. A sinful life is a riches to rags story. His life slides deep into filth and loneliness. He doesn't have a friend in the world to help him anymore. Sin deprived him not only of God, but sin deprived him of happiness. Sin deprived him of friends, of his family, of people who cared about him. The truth is, some of us here tonight can relate to this parable of the prodigal son. This is what living apart from Christ looks like. 
This is what living apart from God's perspective, from God's plan for your life looks like. God the Father watches his rich but rebellious children waste and throw away his love, his riches, as they run from him to the far country of sin. You know, church, sometimes we too are those rebellious sons who trade our riches of heaven for sin, for filth and dirt. Sometimes we are those rebellious people who trade the eternal and spiritual blessings of God for moments of satisfaction in sinful pleasures. <clears throat> Let me remind you that living your life for instant gratification will rob you of spiritual and physical blessing. Just like the younger son of this story, we are those sinners who want all the goodness of God's creation and we want all the enjoyment of God's blessings, but we don't want God himself. But we don't want the Father. We don't want a relationship with the Heavenly Father. We enjoy being fatherless. We do not understand his love. We don't understand his fatherhood. We refuse to respond to his love. And many of us continue to live in sin day after day to waste our lives and waste away chasing every desire of the flesh. We need repentance. We need to repent before our Heavenly Father. Let me remind you that every day you are trading your life. You are trading your soul for something. The question is, for what? When it's all over and you have cashed in all the time and abilities that you have been allotted, what will you have to show for it? If you trade it in for fleeting pleasures, for sin, to gratify your immediate needs, you will become empty. You will become poor. But if you trade your life for God's kingdom, if you trade your life for God's righteousness and holiness to fulfill God's purpose in your life, you will be satisfied. You will be made whole. The emptiness in your heart all of a sudden will be filled. The truth is, church, life apart from God is really a slow death. If we live our lives apart from God, we are living only to die apart from God. But repentance is dying to live. Repentance is dying to the self, dying to our sinful lifestyle. And that allows us to find life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is when you experience the change of mind, when you have decided that you had enough of this lifestyle in sin and you desperately seek God's intervention in prayer. If you had enough, you're tired of the way that you are living. There was one day in my life when I said, I have enough of my life. I want God to intervene. I want God to save me. I want God to lift me to a new level. Repentance is putting your trust in God instead of trusting yourself in your own abilities, in your own strength. Repentance is to look away from yourself completely and to look to God, to be desperate for God. To be desperate for a relationship with God. To say, Heavenly Father, I need you. I can't live this life and I don't want to live my life without you. Do you want to repent? Do you want a relationship with the Heavenly Father? On this Father's Day, I invite you to have a relationship with the Father. We must repent before God because sin will make you think and go insane. Living in sin will make you mentally ill and crazy. 
This is what made the prodigal son. For a moment, he literally went crazy. Sin will not only take you from a life of hell, but unrepented sin will take you ultimately, literally, to the place called hell. So you get double hell. The place of hell is not a fun place to be. The Bible says that there is great sorrow in hell. There's sadness, there's emptiness, there's loneliness. There's a lot of great pain and torture that will last not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, not for 10 years, but for eternity. Ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Repent. Repent. There are three adjustments that come to the son's life. First is recognition. Verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, you see that he went crazy. This suggests that he had been out of his mind in rebellion and his sin. He lived a crazy nightmare but called it a dream for a season. But one day something happened. Something snapped back into place. All of a sudden, he came to his senses again, and he began to recognize something. He recognized the goodness of God. Hallelujah. One day, I too recognized the goodness of God. One day, I had my return back to the Father. He recognizes that he was a servant in the fields begging for the pods that swine eat. But in his father's house, the hired servants have more than enough bread. And unlike the master in the far country, the younger son's father is generous towards those who serve him. From this story, we learn that a man cannot repent unless he recognizes the insanity of sin in sight of God's goodness. Living apart from God, living apart from God's grace amounts to a life of craziness, to a life of sin, to a life of perversion. So first comes recognition. This prodigal son comes to his senses one day. Second comes a resolution. The son decides that his place is back with his father. No matter what it will cost him, he wants to come back to his father. Praise the Lord. Your place is back with your heavenly father. Tonight, you can have your homecoming back to the father. More than that, this prodigal son decides to make one of the greatest confessions in the Bible. He confesses his sin against heaven, against God as well as his father. He was aware of a holy God. He was aware of a broken law. He makes no more excuses, and he offers no more explanations. He knew in his mind that he was wrong, and he needed to ask for forgiveness. He needed to repent. He needed to come back to his father. The problem with most confessions today is that they primarily express regret for the consequences of sin rather than the regret for sin itself. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that many people today give their life to God because they are scared of going to hell rather than giving their life to God because they love God because they want a relationship with God, because they want to live every day and walk with God. If you want to experience a godly repentance, you must make a decision today. You must draw the line today and say, enough is enough. I've had it with this sinful life. I want to return home. What a beautiful day to return home to the Heavenly Father. On Father's Day, you will forever remember this day, your return home to your Heavenly Father. Rather than putting your trust in your friends, 
Rather than putting your trust in money, in pleasures, in all the other sins, today you can repent and you can start to put your trust in God. Again, first comes recognition. The prodigal son comes back to his senses. Second comes a resolution. He confesses his sin. And third comes resignation. He sees himself and his sins in light of God's goodness and greatness. He knows his depravity, so he resigns any thoughts of sonship. Now he would settle to be a servant in the father's house. Given his sins, he can't claim to be a son, but I can only hope, he can only hope to be a servant. Like the prodigal son from our story, when we turn to God with true repentance, with resignations from our sins, we begin to see and we begin to experience God as we have never seen him before. We began to recognize the greatness of God's love on a whole new level. We began to see his generous character in a different dimension. If you truly want to repent of your sins, if you are truly sorry, if you are truly remorseful of your sinful lifestyle, if you truly express godly sorrow, If you confess your sins today, Scripture says that He is faithful and just to forgive you, 1 John 1 verse 9. Repentant people plead only for a servant's place. And they would leave all their sins for the lowest place in the kingdom of heaven, Psalm 84 verse 10. If you want to repent, if you want to make it to heaven, repentance is not an option. Repentance is mandatory. Repent because today there is a second chance for a new beginning. Repent because God is still a loving Father. Today may be your second and last chance. Then one day, from the distance, the father sees a filthy beggar slowly walking. And he thinks to himself, is that my son? His heart begins to beat faster and to beat faster. Oh, it's my son. His heart fills with love and compassion, and he races suddenly out to meet his son. The father sweeps him up in his arms, hugs him dearly, and kissed him over and over. The son said, Father, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. And the father interrupts him and says, Son, you are home now. And turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and place it on his shoulders. Bring me the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. And let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For my beloved son was once dead, but now he's alive again. Once he was lost, but now he's found. His homecoming, his homecoming godly sorrow, his repentance gets the Father's attention. His repentance radiates God's rich grace for the repentant sinner. There is love. There is grace and compassion. There is tenderness in his his embrace. There is adoption and there is generosity. The father receives him back as his son and not as a servant. Praise the Lord. If you repent and turn back to God, to the heavenly father, he will receive you back as a son. He will receive you back as a daughter. And not anything less. The father in the story is a reflection of our God. Of our heavenly father. 
Our Heavenly Father is ready to pour out the storehouses of His grace, of His mercy at the faraway sign of your return, of your repentance. Will you be that prodigal son tonight? Will you be that prodigal daughter tonight? The sinner who repents can receive grace, forgiveness, mercy, restoration, healing. I don't know what your problems are, but you can receive a solution. Jesus Christ is your solution. God receives the sinner. He receives the prodigal. Don't be ashamed. We sang that song that said, leave the shame at the door because now you're in the Father's house. But it's not enough that you're in the Father's house. You have to return to the Father. You have to repent to the Father. You have to receive His Son, Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. Return back to the Father. He receives the repentant son. He receives the repentant daughter with the riches of heaven, with the robes of Christ, with the signet of salvation, with the banquet of salvation. You were once a poor and filthy beggar living in the filthiness of sin. But if you repent tonight, you can inherit a kingdom. And it's not just any kingdom. It's a kingdom where its foundations are built with precious stones. Where the roads and streets are built of pure gold. Wow. I want to inherit that kingdom. I don't know about you, but that's what repentance does. That's what coming home does. That's what restoration does. That's what the love of the Heavenly Father does. True repentance reflects the miracle of the new birth. Verse 24 says, The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. When we repent, a resurrection is happening. If you were once dead in trespasses, if you were once dead in your sins in which you once walked, now you have been made alive through Jesus Christ. The son from our story has been dead to the father. But in the miracle of repentance, he has been raised to newness of life. He has been brought back, not as a corpse to a funeral, but as a living soul for a banquet. Heaven is ready to celebrate with you in your salvation tonight. But you have to make the move. Have to step out in faith. You have to repent. You have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Heaven finds repentance beautiful. You know why? Because it brings back to life those whom sin had killed. The father's reaction to the returning of the prodigal son reveals six things about God. One, he was filled with compassion. Our God is compassionate for the lost in sin. Matthew 9, 36. Two, he ordered the servants to put the best robe on his son. You know what? God dresses the sinners that come to him with the robes of his righteousness. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Thirdly, He ordered the servants to put a ring on his finger, which is a symbol of acceptance to the family. God treats people who return to him as his sons, as his daughters, not as his servants. 1 John 3 verse 1. Fourthly, he ordered the servants to put sandals on his son's feet. Only free men would wear them. Sinners who come and return to God find everlasting freedom, according to John chapter 8, verse 32. Fifthly, he ordered the servants to kill the fattened calf. In order to save us, God did not spare anything, not even his beloved son. 
John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, for whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lastly, he celebrated his son's return. You know that when we, we come back to God, when we repent of our sins, there is great joy amongst the angels in heaven. Heaven celebrates your return. Heaven celebrates your salvation, according to Luke 15, verse 10. I want us to stand tonight. I want us to stand in the presence of God. If you still find yourself in the pig swamp of sin, looking for purpose, looking for meaning in this life, the rewards of coming back to God will be greater than anything you will ever risk doing in your life. I want us to bow our heads tonight, right now. The Spirit of God is here and He is moving from heart to heart. He is searching a heart that wants to repent, that wants to give their life to Him. With our heads bowed down and our eyes closed, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Ready? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life. Amen. With our heads still bowed down and our eyes closed, I want to ask a question tonight. On this Father's Day, are you ready to meet the most wonderful and good Father? If that is you, I want you to raise your hand high in faith. Right now, raise your hand. Like the prodigal son from our story who reunited with his father, you can meet and reunite with the Heavenly Father if you only accept the sacrifice of his son Jesus Christ. And you can do that at this altar right now. I want you to walk out here at this altar right now. Come in the presence of God. The Heavenly Father is waiting with His arms wide open, ready to receive you. If you repent, God will be your Father. But if you continue to live in sin, the Bible says that the devil is the father of all lies. On this Father's Day, I invite you to come to this altar of salvation to experience repentance of your sins, to experience your home coming back to the Heavenly Father. Right now, come to this altar. There is still time today to repent. There's time today to change your life around. The clock is ticking and one day it will be too late. And when that time is too late, it's too late forever. It's late for eternity. The Father is watching from the distance. His arms are already open wide. Come to the Father tonight. He will receive you. He will forgive you. He will restore you. He will love you. He will give you a second chance tonight. But come to this altar and give your life to Jesus Christ. As we continue to sing, I continue to invite you to come. There's somebody here tonight that is struggling. They're not sure if they should come in the front. But the Spirit of God says, give your life to God because your days are numbered. Come to the front and give your life to Jesus. Let us sing.